So I am honoured in in the new cabin, my 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 inaugural guest in the new cabin. This is the designer of Undaunted, the designer of War Chest, one of the hottest new names in the game design world, and a man that wakes up entirely too early. This is David Thompson. David, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be the first ever guest at the new cabin. I, I do have to ask, what happened to the old cabin? Uh, infestation, zombie infestation, along with murder fairies, and so we had to burn it down. Yeah, well, it had a, it had, it had a lot of awesome visitors. I, I feel bad for all those people that, that got left behind. But Well, you know, they provided good flames. Okay. It was it was good to look at when when human fat renders. Anyway, so my my first question is, and this is you know this is a question that allows you to be immodest because we rarely get to in this world. So my my first question is is when did you realize you were good at what you do? Yeah. So um, so I I watch your you know your show. So I've seen this. I know this question is coming right. This is an extremely uncomfortable question for me to answer because I have huge problems with imposter syndrome. So, um, it, I, I, I think there's a, a lot of little things that have made me feel like, oh, maybe I do know what I'm doing, but those are extremely fleeting moments, right? So, you know, um, relatively early on with War Chest, Richard Garfield reached out and said, hey, I really like your game. And I was like, oh, that, that's, that's awesome. Hmm. Um, John Butterfield, if you know him, he's a well-known war game designer, solo um, stuff. I saw one time he had one of my games on his table, right? So people whose opinion I value um, seem to have enjoyed some of the stuff I've created or helped create in the, in the case of War Chest. Um, that means a lot, but I will tell you that I talked a lot about this with my co-design partner, Trevor Benjamin, my main design partner. Um, like when a game comes out, it seems like I'm never able to just enjoy it. You know, you receive it and you're like, oh, what's going to be the error with it? Or, and you, you know, you just like, oh, this is a great thing. And you just kind of move on. So it's not something I've really thought about other than trying to, to think of an answer for your question. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure I've ever felt like I kn I'm good at what I do. I felt like, sometimes I feel like, you know, oh, people like the game despite all its faults. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> So it's interesting, what you've referred to there is external reinforcement, you know, people you respect saying it's good, but, you know, War Chest is, is fantastic, Undaunted is fantastic, they're both games that really work and really flow really well. Is there any sense of, you know, can you put the imposter syndrome aside and, and be playing the game and sometimes think, wow, yeah, I think I've, I think I'm onto something here. Yeah, I would say that the game that I think captures that the most for me and it's because i play it all the time with my seven-year-old son as war chest right mm. and so he my son gets war chest um it's an easy game to learn right um it's an easy game to play at different levels of play right so so almost anybody can get into it quickly I, i'm proud of the fact that even though it's considered an abstract game by most most of the core uh unique actions of units are still thematic thematically inspired so that people like my son can play it and so if there's any game that i can be of my own design that i can be in the middle of playing and really just enjoy it right and and think that you know i i've contributed something contributed something valuable to the game design world it's probably war chest when i'm playing with my son so I don't know whether it's universal, but it seems to me almost universal praise for your two sort of biggest titles, Undaunted and War Chest. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with people being very nice about your work? Are you a modest person or you're a person who thinks about, about time? Um, I definitely, so just me in general, um, I'm definitely a person who fixates on negatives, right? And so I don't have a good memory at all. Uh, again, my, you know, when Trevor and I are doing design work, he keeps great notes for us, which is, you know, we've settled into this pattern where we each have strengths and weaknesses and we build mm -hmm. on our strengths. Um, I have a horrible memory, but the things that I can remember in life are always the negative things. So they're the mm -hmm. things that stood out and form my, my strongest memories. So when I think about not so much war chest, right? Because we will play war chest and they like it, um, you don't get a lot of negative comments. You just kind of get, they either pass it by or they like it. Hmm. 
Undaunted is a, is, you know, you say it, it's received universal praise and certainly it's, it's gotten, you know, it's won awards and stuff, but it draws a ton of negative criticism, usually from two camps, right? One is a, is a hardcore war gamer camp who just love to just say it's not a war game and hate on it. And that's fine. I don't really care about that camp, right? That's, that's fine. Cause I, I actually spend a lot of time in the war game world on my solo war game designs, independent mm. of Undaunted and War Chest. Um, the part that really hits, hurts me hard about Undaunted is the amount of um, sort of hate it's received but from like camps about the cover of it, right? Talking about how it's ahistorical a- 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 and its representation of, you know, African-Americans in World War II and stuff. And so, and that comes from a place of ignorance. And I don't mean ignorance like in the traditional racism sense, but more ignorance about well, that's not actually true. You know, African-Americans hmm. did fight in World War II and stuff. And I, and I don't like that the game um, causes these kind of camps of people to come out and be so vocal about it in a negative way. Um, and I know we've I've totally tangented from your your original question, but but those are the things that I spend my time thinking about, right? I don't spend my time thinking like, oh, it's it's you know universally loved, right? I spend my time thinking, well, how do I combat this ignorance about the game? So you know. You- both of these titles could broadly speaking broadly speaking and i know people are very sort of have have sort of passionate ownership about this but broadly speaking be called war games certainly games that have a, a military thrust you're an ex military person who now works for the military what what is what has been your route into gaming and was it through war games that you came to game design yeah that's a good question so uh, the, the actual answer is no, right? And, and I'll give you the long answer, the David Thompson answer, if you will. So um, I didn't start board gaming until around 2011, 12, something mm. like that. Uh, very late. I, I came from an RPG playing background. I didn't even really know what board games were. Um, you know, I would, I would walk in the game store and I would see them, you know, but I'm like, I don't know what that is. Um I was listening to the Secret Cabal gaming podcast because they originally had RPG material hmm. and um, they started, they were, you know, they, they were playing board games and it sounded interesting. So I, I found a, a local group and, and play, started playing with them. That got me in I, early on. I, I thought I would like Ameritrash style thematic games or whatever. And I re- quickly learned that like Euros kind yep. of were a little bit more interesting to me. Um, but then I discovered the world of like the war game Euro hybrid. Right, if people know those type of those types of games, and that's really my passion. Um, the first one that I played that just grabbed me was A Few Acres of Snow by Martin Wallace. Mm. Um, I credit it, and and really his sort of like um, some of his like design philosophy, I guess you will, as being super influential to me, especially early on. Um, I did, even though I was in the Air Force, that was back in the in the late '90s, early 2000s, long before I got into gaming. And I really, despite me being in the Air Force, and I still work for the Department of Defense now as a civil servant, mostly with the Air Force, um, I didn't really discover my passion for military history until much later on. Mm. Um, and that was about the time I moved to the UK uh, in 2014. I started digging deeply into my grandfather's past. He was in uh, World War II. And that was the genesis of how Undaunted came to be. I started discovering board games and starting working on design work and this love for, you know, military history all sort of coalesced at the same time into what would eventually become Undaunted. But yeah, those those things, it's interesting. I mean, they, they seem related and perhaps subconsciously they were, but, you know, there's actually a bit of difference between the two. And so if you look at both Undaunted and uh and war chest you could conceivably call them both deck builders right so so to what degree are the long fingers of a few acres of snow sort of over your design process yeah so, I mean, 100% right so i went back um recently and looked at emails that i had written when i was initially conceptualizing undaunted and i openly and i was writing an email to some of my friends uh who i was going to have play tested for me and I openly referenced a few acres of snow as a design inspiration. And if you you know if you've played it, it's a deck a game driven by deck building mm. that has a spatial component of which there's not that many. There's starting to be more and more now, but uh, there's not that many. And so clearly that was a, des- a design influence for Undaunted. Um, Undaunted 
directly led to war chest. I mean, if you've played them both, they share a lot of DNA, right? Mm. So after Trevor and I had completed the design for Undaunted, Trevor had an idea. He's like, hey, let's take Undaunted. Because, you know, I, I, did, I did the original conceptualization work on Undaunted. And then Trevor came in and he worked on all the development with me and all the scenario design. And he, I say he took a game and turned it into a good game, right? He right. refined it and polished it. Um, but he, he said, he's much more of like the minimalist than I am, right? Elegant design minimalist. And I'm much more of like, let's do theme integration and, and a little bit of Chrome and stuff. And so he wanted to take Undaunted and distill it down into this sort of like minimalist, elegant core. And that's what, that's what spawned War Chest. So you've mentioned Trevor now, Trevor Benjamin, your, your design partner a couple of times. How did you meet him and how did you decide that you, you jived very well together when it came to designing? Yeah. That, so I'll tell you, you know, a lot of, a lot of life is just being super lucky, right? Being mm. in the right place at the right time. When I, when I moved to the UK in 2014, um, I moved just outside of Cambridge and um, there's a UK playtest meetup group in Cambridge. And it was being led, or I guess it is led by um, Brett Gilbert and Matt Dunstan. And when I joined that group, it had uh, Brett and Matt. It also had Chris Marling, who I worked on, um, Europe Divided with, and um, Armageddon, which was the first game I had designed. So Chris and I worked together on that. Trevor had just joined the group like a month or two before I did. And so uh, we, we, I mean we instantly clicked. I mean, we didn't, you know, we didn't come like best friends, you know, you know, I took years to, to grow that relationship, but, um, but yeah, we just would, you know, we would do the periodically, you know, week meetups. Now this was like, I got there in, in August of 14 and by October of 14, I was taking undaunted to spiel to pitch. Hmm. Um, it was early 2015 when Trevor and I really started working on the development of it together. But over that, you know, I, and I lived there until 2018 and then I moved back to the States. But I mean, we we work, we usually meet two or three times a week for a couple hours a week, you know, every week for the last five or six years. So um, he's gone from being a guy who I met in a pub in Cambridge in 2014 at this meetup to one of my best friends in the world now. So, And so we're for the for the for the the viewer who doesn't know this we're recording and it's 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 5:47 in the morning where you are in the states and i was sort of incredulous that you would agree to meet me at, at such a you know obscene time in the morning and and you were telling me that between 4 and 6:30 is your game design time can you give us an overview of your game design process yeah. how you get from you know an idea to a game in a box and also how you cope with having the hours of a baker so yeah let's, we'll talk about the hours thing first because that's pretty easy so you know what happens i think with with people who start getting into anything right but in this case game design who also have a family and a full-time job. You've got to you've got to juggle this stuff, right? Yeah. And so I'm I'm lucky in that it's sort of a you know part-time job slash my primary hobby. So I'm I am dedicating a lot of time to it. And um, I mean I think I saw myself you know I would spend a lot of time in the afternoons and then the in the weekends and stuff working on it. And I think I saw this myself, but even my wife kind of brought it up, and not in a not in a rude way. She just kind of you know hey do you mind you know managing your time in in different way or whatever. And ultimately, it became obvious that I needed to make sure that I, I partitioned my time, right? So I've got a day job. Obviously, that, that is what it is. I didn't want to have get into this routine where I was coming home and spending a bunch of time in front of a computer away from the family working on game design stuff. And so I basically just established, okay, from, you know, whatever time I wake up, which is usually right around four until I get to, until I go to work, that's game design time. The family's all sleeping. I'm not taking any time away from them. Um, and then I just really don't do any game design work in the afternoons or the or on the weekends unless I'm meeting up with somebody to do mm. it, right? Somebody. Um, so I don't. I just don't. I, I just kind of partition the time that way. Um, so to answer your question, that the process, I, the the answer is it depends heavily, and it depends on the kind of game that I'm working on, right? So there, I would say there's sort of three camps of games that I work on. One is the stuff that I've worked with Trevor on. Uh, mostly Undaunted or, or War Chest, and the things it has then sort of spawned 
or commissions that like people have reached out. So we have a game coming out with Blacklist called Dire Alliance that I would say also share some DNA with Warchest and Undaunted. So those games, you know, a publisher reach out or we have some other expansion for, for Undaunted or Warchest. Um, so those kinds of, at this point, those just kind of have their own genesis, right? Mm. A publisher reach out, we have a thing we have to do, we work on it, we get it done. Um, there's a second camp that I'm starting to get a little bit more involved with, with, with people like I'm working with Trevor and Brett Gilbert on a couple of designs that are more from their camp. And what I mean by that is if you think of their kind of stuff, it's usually more family friendly, abstract kind of stuff. Yeah. And that will always start. Um, I say always, it'll usually start with them having a, a sort of like mechanical hook or something like that. And we'll just flesh the game out from there. Um, the vast majority of my solo time when I'm designing in the mornings is my war game designs, most of which are solo war games. Hmm. That is a v- much different process. I'll, I'll come up with whatever the historical event I want to work on. I'll usually do about six months to a year of research before I even start the design. I'll do a modeling process where I'll sort of deconstruct the historical event into a model independent of the game design, and then I'll craft the, the design around it. And usually what I'm trying to do is, and this is different than um, people like, you know, you had mentioned you, your chat with Volko. So Volko, I would submit, has a modeling process where he's trying to model objective activities that occurred during an event and then mm. have them represented in the game. Usually I'm designing games, war, my war games, at a much, much smaller scale. Usually it's what we call a skirmish scale. So it's like one guy on a counter. And it's a much more like intimate, emotional, historical event. And so I'm trying to find the most um, important events that occurred during that that battle or whatever it is that I want to evoke to the player. So I'm I'm not so much I don't so much care about like the historicity of the actual event, but hmm. trying to evoke a certain emotion from players while they're playing it. So you can see that you know all three of those different sort of camps of games they have very different processes. And so. How important, you, you've already mentioned sort of your concerns with people's issues with with, with the historicity of, of Undaunted. I mean, how important to you is historical fidelity? And, and, and why also, what is it that's compelling to you about the singular story? The story of one man up against the elements? Yeah, yeah. So I, I will say that uh, historicity it can it historicity has different levels of importance depending on what the design intent is right so so undaunted's design intent is not to be accurate to history right so mm. I went you know for undaunted Normandy I did go to all the battlefield so part of this was that was where my grandfather was in the unit that undaunted is about right so I visited all the battlefields um, but I did, like the scenarios in daunted are not designed to accurately reflect those right it's just sort of an inspiration if you will um so the design intent for undaunted is not to accurate accurately represent history Mm. right and so that's when you know when we had conversations with osprey early on about the art direction and we we did have you know an integrated platoon i was fine with that because the design for undaunted is not to be this super historically accurate piece it's supposed to have, you know, a, a sort of broader representation and be thematically inspired. When I'm doing these uh, solo war games, they are often, a, well, they are, they're always accompanied by this like 40 to 60 page historical booklet that literally mm-hmm. all it is, is a companion piece that tells the history and goes through and talks about how the, the history is modeled in the game. And so it's extremely important, right? That the whole point I'm trying to do there where I'm modeling a true event is my ultimate goal is to pay homage to the people who were part of that event. And I want to tell their story as, as, you know, accurately, um, accurately relative to the thing that I think it's important to tell the story about. Right. So I don't care like what shoes they were wearing. Right. Mm. That doesn't matter. But I do care passionately that the player understands the, the, the challenges they had, et cetera. And, and, and so what, what do you think, you know, modeling these events can teach us about today. Can they teach us something about today? Or are they sort of crystallized in amber in the past and interesting fossils? 
I think it's, it, that's a good question. I haven't necessarily thought about trying to apply the lessons of the past to today and what it can teach us. I think, I think just knowing that these events occurred, right? And so, you know, um, I recently had a game come out. It's called Soldiers in Postman's Uniforms. And it's about the defense of the Polish post office in the free city of Danzig on the first day of World War One or two. Mm. And it's, it's the story that outside in Poland, it's, it's, you know, relatively speaking, it's a well-known story, right? You have these postmen, they're defending a, their post office against all odds against German attackers. And, you know, it includes SS and, and the Danzig police. And ultimately they set the building on fire and they kill people. And it's, it's truly horrific. Um, I think, I think it's important that just people outside of Poland are exposed to these kinds of stories and these acts right. of terrorism, right? Um, can it be applied to today? I mean, certainly when you talk about standing up against horrific, you know, a horrific adversary or horrific actions or whatever, taking action against it. I think that's a story that can always be applied. But for me, I think it's just, like I said, paying homage to these people, trying to bring their story to light. And so, you know, there's, there's, you know, a, a definite focus on bringing the stories of history to life, but also their games, right? You're not writing books, you're not writing movies, you're you're creating games. So they have to function in that medium too. What What is it for you that's the crux of a good game design? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, I would say, again, it depends. So from a purely gameplay perspective, um, one of the reasons that Trevor and I work so well together, and, and the other designer I've been working with a lot lately, Roger Tankersley. So he, we work together on um, an upcoming game called Sniper Elite, which is a, a video a board game adaptation of a video game. But he and I have also worked on a couple of other projects recently. And the reason I work well, so well with those two guys is we all share a philosophy of, of just trying to distill the game down to its core, right? Its mm-hmm. minimalistic core. And so seldom will you see me grafting on like extra chromey bits to a game with the exception of those historical war games where I make a decision, you know, I say, okay, look, this is, it's an extra gameplay element. It's a extra rule. Does it have enough payoff to justify the thing that I'm trying to, to accomplish in the story that I'm trying to tell? And so an example of that would be, there's another game in that series of solo war games called Castle Itter. It's an incredible story. I won't tell it here, but it's just unbelievable. It's the only time the U.S. and the Germans fought together during World War II. But you have these guys, and they're defending this, this castle, literally a medieval-style castle. And there's a French tennis player who was a prisoner, and during the battle, he escapes. And it's important that he escapes, right? It's part of the story. Um, so there's a whole part of the game maybe you know, maybe a page of the rules dedicated to like how you can orchestrate that escape hmm. and so there has to be like there you know clearly that's not a minimalist elegant approach to game design right like i had to add a whole extra bit to that um but it's a it's a design it's a decision right you have to make it so what is the most important thing that i'm trying to accomplish with this game well if this game is about telling this story i have to be willing to sacrifice some of the the elegance of the game so yeah, I, I think that that's my design philosophy is start with the most elegant possible solution and then only add to that if absolutely necessary to achieve whatever the goal is. Yeah, I mean, I my, my first love in gaming when I really thought, oh, I'm a gamer was Eurogames. And I'm rediscovering those sort of 90s, early 2000s Kinesia designs, right? That are sort of three rules and yet infinite depth. And, and when I wrote my review of Undaunted, I talked about how game, as an art form, games are more... They're not about simulation. They're about representation. They're about evocation. To what degree do you agree with that? Do you think that it's about a mechanic evoking something rather than, you know, endless combat resolution tables and rolling for which cannon you shoot? Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Right. That's, that's the question. Uh, or that's that, that's the thing that I think I'm always striving to accomplish is, you know, what are we trying to evoke? What's the, what's the experience that we're delivering? Um, it helps that Trevor is an absolutely massive Kinesia fan. Mm. And so if you see, if you ever see echoes of like that sort of elegance that in anything that we've worked on before, you can, you can bet that that was Trevor's influence on how we got there. Right. 
Um, but no, totally agree with your point about evoking like the, 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 what are we, every, every decision is like, what, what are we trying to evoke and cause the player ex to experience? Right. And, and so how you, you mentioned earlier that you and Trevor have different strengths and weaknesses. I mean, what are those? What do you both contribute to the relationship? Yeah. So for sure. Um, I, there's a lot of like little super tactical things that fit really well. Like, and I'll give you an example. So I already mentioned, you know, Trevor does a fantastic job of taking notes, right? So as soon as we start a game, he'll take notes. And I'll tell you if there's any like wood, like uh, early game designers that are watching this, here's an awesome note that I'll tell you that I wish I had learned six years ago. When we work on a design and we try something, we try a solution, right? And it doesn't work. Trevor uh, we'll always do a good job of noting that we tried this thing and it doesn't work. And this is why it didn't work. Hmm. And that sounds small. It sounds like, oh, well, whatever. But if you don't do that, then you wind up coming back to that same quote unquote solution. Right. And you, you will either forget that you didn't work or you'll forget why it didn't work and you have to reiterate through it. So, so he does a fantastic job of keeping notes. Um, he's always, we, I mean, we both have a, like a general, like I said, a shared philosophy, but on the edges of that philosophy, I'll always sort of like, I'll bring the thematic element to the game, right? And so um, if it's, you know, if it's undaunted, I'm the one who's researching, okay, this is what the long range desert group and did in North Africa. Here's where mm -hmm. we're going to come from. I'll come with the the thematic backing and I'll, I'll usually be the one that's like, okay, let's try this scenario. Let's let, you know, based on the historic, what happened historically, let's build it this way. And then he'll be the one who typically will push us towards refinement. Right. Mm. Um, and, and I think that, you know, with this point, we've gotten to a point where we, we, well, what we have, we, we feel so comfortable with each other that we can, uh, Hey, that that's, not going to work. That's not a good idea, right. et cetera. So being able to get past this idea, and this is something you, you, you'll you deal with when you're working with a, a co-design partner for the first time. You know, how do you establish what that relationship's like? How do you communicate? Um, so yeah, I would say definitely I would bring the, the, the thematic side. He would bring the refinement side. He's good at note taking. We, we by necessity live completely in a virtual environment. He, so he lives mm -hmm. in the UK still. Um, so everything we do is on tabletop simulator. We haven't actually designed a game with physical bits in about five years. Mm. So we've been, we started using tabletop simulator in 2015. Um, so most games that you've played from us have only ever existed digitally during their design process, other than the other people play testing them. Um, so I do all of the like tabletop simulator bits and all of that kind of, you know, ha uh, handling that. So, yeah, we just kind of divide it, you know, each, each of those responsibilities differently. And so, how does it feel? Because you, you've you've not been a gamer for a huge amount of time, and a designer slightly shorter than that. How does it feel when you get the the ring on the door, and you get your author copies, and you take the game out of the box, and you know you see you see it in its final form, and it's got your name on the cover? I mean, how does that feel? Is it is it exciting? Yeah, it's an interesting question. It goes back to the very first question you asked. So. It's a mixture of excitement and absolute like horror because, <laughs> um, so really what it is, is it's, I'm super excited. Like right now, Undaunted Reinforcements is about to come out, right? Um, I, I assume that the, the pre-production copy is, or the, the first production copy, like they've, they've sent me one. So it's probably in the mail now or will be soon. I cannot wait to get it, right? I cannot wait to get it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to open it. And I'm going to be like, oh but there's going to be errors in here. We're going to have messed something up, you know? So it's always this weird, you're like, I can't wait to possibly see it. I'm so excited. And then I see it. I'm like, Oh, but there's going to be problems. And so there's this weird point of like, you know, of, of that duality or whatever, however you want to say it, where you're, you know, the two, the two emotions are kind of at odds, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Right. So sometimes, you know, I'll be in the middle of working with somebody on a project and I just sit back and I say, you know, uh, Osprey. Osprey said, hey, we've got the next two years of Undaunted scheduled out. So the, the two projects that come after reinforcements. Hmm. And you'll be and I'll be, you know, in the middle of working on it and it's like we're on month seven or something and be grinding. I'm like, this is bad. And I was like, but wait, you know, if you had said five years ago that I'd be working on the fifth part of this, you know, popular game, right? Like I would have given anything for that. 
Right. So you just have to take a step back and appreciate the success. And yeah. Now is your chance to pitch to us. What what do you have coming out in the future? So you've already mentioned undaunted reinforcements. What else can we see from you? So yeah, so like everybody, you know, the, the COVID year actually impacted a lot of projects. So there's quite a few things that are backed up. I, I mentioned um, Dire Alliance Horror. So mm-hmm. that is a game with Blacklist. Like I said, it, it takes DNA from War Chest and, and Undaunted, and you use that sort of deck building driven mechanic to uh, control horror themed creatures in this this um yeah like in this this horror world which is really cool We're excited about that we really haven't ever done a proper like minis quote unquote game so mm-hmm. this is like our first you know foray into that uh that's with trevor um uh i have a game coming out called uh Lanzareth ridge which is the next game in that series of solo war games that i've talked about with pavlov's house and and castle litter and stuff so that that'll be on um kickstarter in december it's about the Battle of the Bulge, so it's it's there for the anniversary. Um, I'm going to forget a bunch of stuff. Undaunted Reinforcements, obviously, is coming out. Um, I mentioned before that Trevor and I worked together, and also Roger Tankersley. The three of us actually collaborated on a game called um, uh, Resist, and it's about the Spanish Maquis. Um, mm-hmm. Most people don't even, when they think of the Maquis, they think of the French Maquis. There was a Spanish Maquis. They were active during War t- World War II, but they're more well known for their post World War II battle against Franco, trying to liberate Spain. And so this is a game um, about that. It's about the liberation of Spain. It's a much lighter game than most of my war games. It's only sort of war themed, so mm-hmm. it's it's really like a light uh, solo card game. Um, so I'm excited about that. I know I'm forgetting some stuff, but those are the ones that I've been working on recently. So that's that. So you're at a convention, and it's in the evening. It's it's like six o'clock, so it's like thirty minutes before you go to bed, and you're walking through a restaurant, and you you hear a group at a table, and you hear your name mentioned. So you sidle into the corner, and you eavesdrop on them. What do you hope they're saying about you? Yeah, you know, um, well, so first of all, I'll, I'll I'll if you allow me, I'll tangent just a little bit. The coolest compliment I ever ever get on any of my games is when a parent plays one of my games with their child, right? And that get, I get that a lot from War Chest. I get that a lot from Undaunted. I think it's super cool, especially when you have like a war gamery parent who says, oh, I, because of Undaunted, I was able to play my a game that I like playing with my, my child. Hmm. So the coolest thing would be to walk up and see somebody playing one of my games with their kids, right? Like that's just the coolest compliment. Um, I, I mean, I just, you know, I hope they're having fun. Right. You know, I hope they're enjoying their time spending together playing the game. And so the last question is what I ask everybody. Uh, why is gaming good? I think I think I just I think I just kind of alluded to it. Right. It's time to spend together with your with your friends and family. I I'm super lucky. I have three kids, um, 12, 10 and seven. The 12 year olds getting a little bit too cool to hang out with dad, mm. you know, sometimes. But the, the 10 and seven year old. Hey, do you want to play a game? Yes. And then that is, that is intentional time. And so when you think about intentional time at this point in like modern society, you know, even if we say, Hey, let's sit down and watch a show together. Maybe half the time people are like on the device, not Mm -hmm. even watching this. We have, we have a device in front of the device. Right. Yeah. And so board games just really do. It forces intentional time with whoever you're with. Right. And so with my kids, that's, that's priceless. So, yeah. Brilliant. Well, David Thompson, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been great.